uh, in this session. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here. Um, and when we've done these, we were just chatting, when we've done the presentations, if you want me to say a few words about the exam, uh, I would be more than happy to do that. Um, that would be great. Uh, sorry? That would no, be great. great. That yeah, be great. I mean, I haven't got any, any slides, so I'm ah. happy to talk about it. We've just been chatting about it now. Um, and in fact, we could probably do it between us, couldn't we? You could explain what your experience, which would be good. Um, but anyway, let's do the presentation. So the first presentation is, where is thinnest in highly crosslinked polyethylene hybrid dips, midterm results? Um, and it's Mr. Raj. Raj. Mr. Raj. There we go. Mr. Raj, go for it. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, it takes immense pleasure uh, for me to present in this uh, uh, meeting. I take uh, immense pride in presenting to our esteemed colleagues. Um, as I said before, I don't consider myself as a consultant or a staff grade or a SHO. I consider myself as an orthopedic professor, and I'm very much interested in research and publications. So um, I thank uh, Mr. Shalabi for providing me a platform to present my few presentations today. Now, the first one, is uh, we, uh, I work, my name is Mr. Rajkumar Tangaraj. I'm a, a, a X-ray surgeon in a, a self at Prince Royal Hospital. And my consultant, uh, I work for Mr. Raf Perkins, who is a hip consultant. And we've been doing a, a hybrid, uh, total hip replacement for primary hip osteoarthritis. And uh, this first one is we are looking in terms of a clinical survival of a thinnest polyethylene, highly crossing polyethylene. Ever made and ever made and marketed uh, so far. Now, uh, so the background is, as you can see, this is uh, the standard exited hip replacement with the large head, 40 millimeter head, on a uh, uncemented uh, trident shell with a X3 polyethylene liner. Now, conventional teaching, or when we did the uh, previous biomechanics studies in the past, is the minimum thickness for a polyethylene. In order to provide a decent survival ship is around six millimeter, but for highly crossing polyethylene, we don't know the exact uh, number so far. But we assume it will be slightly lesser. But who has got the willpower to use the thinnest poly? Now, so and the thickness of the polyethylene liner also varies between the head of the, uh, the femoral head size as well as the acetabular shell size. Now, uh, the try uh, the striker has made the uh, X3. Uh, is a uh, X3 polyethylene. The X3 is called it's, uh, because it's a triple annealed process, but by it produces highly cross-linked cross chains. And uh, in that measure, when it's been used for a 40 millimeter heads for, against a 50 or 52 millimeter astral shell, the thickness of the polyethylene is only 3.8 millimeter. Now, I could not find any other polyethylene which is as thin as that. Now the X3 liner, it's just a little bit of background is, it's an ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, but the new annealing process is you irradiate or heat it to a submelting uh, sub uh, temperature three times, so that it produces crosslink chain. Uh, so the fatigue strength is better, and the wear, but the important thing is the surface wear property is much, much better than a conventional polyethylene. So uh, this is, uh, these are all based on in vitro studies. Uh, on the oxidation resistance uh, against the pr pr presence of any pr pr free radicals is also greater. Uh, but as any marketing thing, we always get uh, very enthusiastic when there is an in vitro studies. But whether it is surviving in vivo, or even if it survives in vivo, is it, if it become a clinical problem or not, that's what we are more interested as a treated clinicians. So our primary objective uh, was to see whether there has been a significant excessive wear when we are using this thinnest polyethylene, which ended up requiring a revision at a yearly stage, then compared to the other, uh, than a normal standard revision rate. Uh, the secondary objectives during the study was to assess uh, the implant survival ship, dislocation, infection, you know, the routine complications, what we would have expected in totally previous months. Uh, the inclusion criteria were very simple. We looked at over a time period of two years, from November 2006 to October 2008, uh, those patients who had 40 EX3 liner. Now, the reason I'm saying 40 EX3 liner is the 36 EX3 liner or a 32 EX3 liner is much more thicker. So 
that doesn't make, uh, so the thickness is much more thicker. So it's more than six millimeters. So we don't need to, uh, we didn't go into that. So we particularly looked into those patients over that time period. And our method is a very, very simple retrospective case series. So it's not very high profile um, uh, X-ray, uh, X-rays, follow-up, or any blood test or anything like that. All we did is we collected the, all the set of notes uh, from the patient. We identified the patients who had uh, hip replacement between 2006 and 2008. The reason we chose that period is that gives us seven years follow-up, which is a decent midterm follow-up for a hip replacement. So it's a retrospective case note review. And once we uh, ho uh, saw the case uh, notes, we looked at the progression of these patients to see if there's been, uh, if anybody had a revision, any infection or anything. And we also looked at the serial x-rays. The serial x-rays were reviewed by the reviewing clinician at the time of clinical consultation. And we took those documentation because most all the time the clinician has documented there was no wear, no loosening, the implants are looking fine. And then both myself and Mr. Perkins looked at those x-rays together and we looked for any evidence of loosening or any wear or any uh, change, in the, uh, change in the appearance of the components. So basically it was a clinical note review, case history and follow up and we looked in terms of any other problems. So the data was collected and there were, we identified 30 patients which were suitable for our studies. Obviously uh, there were 24 female patients because they had a smaller hips, a 6 old male and their procedure was, uh, the age was between 42 to 84, so that was a variation. Uh, they, all these, in these patients' groups, we had 40 millimeter standard heads uh, on 15 patients. The minus four heads were in 15 patients, so they were very good. The Astabla shell is all of them are trident shell, and there are 50 millimeter were 20 and 52 were 10. So the primary outcome, when we looked in summary down line, 19 patients had been discharged as per the present CQC, uh, present PCT guidance because we are not allowed to follow beyond one or two years or five years like the previous kind of, you know. So, but still eight were still being followed up as five year follow up. Three patients had already died due to non-orthopedic related causes. And then to our happiness, what we found that none of the patients so far had any significant wear or losing of the components. And so all these 30 patients, apart from those three people who died, they didn't have any revisions procedures so far. So uh, when we were looking for other uh, secondary outcomes, one patient had an infection uh, later, but that patient had psoriasis before and also uh, medication, so the implant got infected, so that had to be revised, so he had a two-stage revision. So that, and then three patients died because of uh, other causes for, for the, due to malignancy cardiac causes, and we, that gave us a 96.6% uh, survival rate. So for our purpose, for that particular pushing what we asked ourselves, we didn't see any major loosening, no wear or no dislocation. So in conclusion, we haven't seen a major clinically relevant wear. Now, it is very, very difficult to look at the actual thickness of the polyethylene in an X-ray with, uh, with the metal shell in the background, unlike the conventional uh, cemented polyethylene where you can change and see this, it's very difficult. But we have the, that's why I'm putting a caution, caution in the note. We haven't seen a clinically relevant wear or asymptomatic loosening in a revision at uh, seven years. We haven't seen any major outcomes, but the study is a level four evidence. It's not a very high profile study. It's only case series, um, and it's midterm follow-up, and very, very limited number of patients. Um, so we do need to see the patients again 10, 15 years old, because the reason is, if there has been a cliff where that even a little bit of wear is gone, and that 3.8 millimeter is gone. We are suddenly looking in terms of a big 40 millimeter head articulating secondarily with the back of the titanium shell where a cobalt chromium alloy metal head will be articulating against a, a titanium shell which is going to produce a heavy metal debris. So if I'm presenting another series in five years time with a massive revision, then we know that it has gone wrong completely. Um, and obviously that's the reason I said evidence needs to be cautiously interpreted. But so far, so good. Um, so, any questions? Very good. Yeah. So, can you tell me what is the reason for using such a thin polythene in those cases? Um, I have to say that uh, those cases, I joined the team in 2008. These were all done at the time of, that was a practice. But I have to say that ever since I joined the team and uh, two, three years ago I raised my concern, we haven't done it. So, we have changed the practice. 
but we want to look in terms of whether it is actually a problem or not. Because the marketing is, the reason why we had, they had done at the time is because of, we are able to use a 40 millimeter heads and better dislocation, uh, lesser dislocation rate, better primary arc range. So that was the reason they were using it. Yeah, so, so that we can use a 40 millimeter heads. Yeah. That was the main reason. So you so correct me if I'm wrong, you said the five patients still followed up, the rest were discharged. Why this, and the protocol says that you will discharge all your patients in year one or two or maybe five. Your question is why the why they are patients, being they are followed. being followed up for other reasons, not for this hip. So when I'm looking at, uh, when I collected the data, when I say a discharge means they are not coming back to clinic, but those patients are coming for other hip or other needs, so that's the... Oh, okay. Okay, so, so both of those are the questions that I've written down, really. But the bit, the, the second question, is can be taken a bit further perhaps of those that were discharged did you get them back to look at them or get their x-rays to look at them uh, no because as i said this is all retrospective i didn't uh, call any patients i did not uh, ask for specific x-rays it was an untouched unbiased okay so in those that were discharged how many of the group were discharged uh, as a uh, and what period of time were they discharged at? Uh, at five years time. At uh, five years. So in fact, you've only got x-rays on the majority of them for oh, five years. Yeah, but some so of them have come back because the, a few patients have come back for other hip or other knee. And incidentally, we had seen those x-rays. As I said, we didn't, uh, this, it's not a very, very scientific uh, progressive study or anything. All we did was, we had this question, so all we identified that group, we are in the process of seeing whether we have to get them back at 10 years time, but the question is, the, the, this question has been put forward to our uh, managers, and the answer we've got so far is the PCT won't fund it for them to come no. back. No. So, so you'll get them coming back if they fund <coughs> Yeah, so at the moment, our uh, problem is, at the moment with the constraint we having, we don't know what's gonna happen. No. Sorry. You said your criteria of as a, is the losing that whether you have to change it or revise it. But what is the criteria you are using to lose? Is there any scoring, anything you can We look for the standard so Charlie's side. Yeah, all we are looking for the standard the loosening zones of Charlie. What we are looking for is whether on the femoral component or over the astral component, we just apply the same principles so, uh, uh, of and zones and the Charlie's zones of loosening whether we look for those in the exam periods. Just radiological. Just radiological. Data. Not particularly because this uh, this is a seven years follow and uh, this is a very uh, uh, this is the two this group is has reached seven years. Now I'm still collecting another uh, data, so I'm still collecting more patients who have been done over the next uh, between 2008 and 2011 uh, 2012. Because 2012 was the time when I told my boss that I have concerns about using this 40 millimeter heads. So I'm adding more patients to that, but obviously I can't present it because they haven't come to five years follow up. So That's what good. is the evidence you have to support that you cannot use yeah. this thickness of polyethylene? Do you have any evidence to support your case? Sorry, I could you see in your trust you have been using this before, it has been stopped that you have to use this type of polyethylene. Yeah. But there should be like we have minimum thickness we usually use for hips or knees. Yeah. But have you know which is, is there any evidence you have to use this much amount of thickness in a hip? Uh, with using this yeah, yeah. type the, of The 6 millimeter was done on a biomechanic study. Uh, it is in a standard, I mean, it, uh, the 6 millimeter figure is in even the test, Miller's textbook as well. The 6 millimeter is came from the studies in a in vitro biomechanic study on a standard polyethylene, not an ultra high molecular weight or on X3. That's what I'm saying, in relation to X3. We don't know, we don't know, know. there is absolutely no evidence. No evidence. Well, it's no been, evidence. But it's been marketed. Yes, see. This is the thing. Yeah. There's no evidence. It's There's no evidence. Marketed. But it's been marketed, assuming on the uh, millions of cycle they have done out in vitro studies okay. by the company. This is what I'm saying. What? You haven't put in evidence. Can I have a question to, to Mr. Okay, Stanley, please. please? Okay. Can we please? Okay. Yeah, far away. What I want to ask is if there's you got any evidence that this, you say you're not happy with the liner. No, Can no. I never said I'm not happy with the liner. Yeah. I never said I am not happy. You said you have told your concern then that. You no, no. The concern was from 40 millimeter head. That's the next presentation oh. doing. But because we stopped using 40 millimeter heads, we haven't used that liner. So when we are, uh, so I was present. I was uh, uh, collecting the data for my next presentation. In fact, I want to ask, can I do the next presentation first?
so that it will make sense. Uh, so then, uh, that was the main reason we stopped doing the 40 millimeter heads. And incidentally, we also realized that this is the thinnest poly they ever made. In fact, I had this idea, so I sent an email to the striker rep. What is the thickness of this CEX3, 40EX3 uh, lighter? And the reply was 3.8. And then I was shocked because, I, sorry, I'm, I hold a biomechanic degree, so I'm, for us, uh, the reason why we are having thinnest polyethylene in a knee replacement 8 millimeter is because six, below 6 millimeter, we have a high subsurface, uh, sublaminar delamination and subsurface oxidation. And that was the reason we, uh, they, everybody went for 8 millimeter liners. So in a knee replacement, nobody makes anything less than 8 millimeter. But in a hip, I was surprised that their marketing is at 3.8. So these are the things I understood over a time period in my career. I would have never understood this in 2008 or 2009 when I was the first or second year in my job. But over the time period, I realized that. So I went back, looked for it. And I raised my concerns to my con uh, consultant, and uh, so that's why we are changing practice. But we are still keeping an eye on those patients, which is not. But you have to think about one more query. You saying your consultant has changed the practice based on what? Because he has been using it because of you say objection of the thinness is. You will note in my next presentation. Okay, fine. Okay. That, that's good. Then any other questions that anyone's got? Because I, I think that's that's quite interesting, and I think the observation about. Um, the NJR yeah. it, that will that hopefully will bring out because if anyone else is using this yeah. size thickness, then the biggest problem we always have is that we do what we do, and then find and, and then and then it takes a long time. But if lots of people are doing it, or yeah. relatively lots, and the numbers are going into the NJR, it should become obvious. Soon. Yeah, and that's the problem because that's the purpose of my next presentation because. The liner was never a problem before. It's a true union problem we have. We were worried about. Okay. So that's uh, so I should have been. Uh, in fact, I should have asked the Shalabi can I do the, this presentation first? Then you could have understood. <laughs> I never had. We had so much of things. So that's fine. Uh, that, well, if everyone's happy at the moment, let's go on to the second presentation, and then we can grill you some more yeah, sure. in a nice way. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the second presentation. You may as well introduce it yourself. Yeah. So. Um, as I said, uh, this is the, uh, what we are looking in terms of uh, 40 millimeter heads. Now, conventionally, hip society or hip surgeons are more fascinated, uh, want to go hard with the bigger heads. The main reason is, uh, sorry, uh, let me go through. So it's the same team. Uh, so the background is, uh, um, so we want to do big heads purely because of increased stability, better primary range of arc of motion. And as well, the patients feel mechanically a bit stable when they feel it's almost identical to their normal femoral head. So that's the reason the hips are resurfacing, everything has been in the work. Now, but the problem is always the metal debris from metal metal articulation, we know how it went. So, but what we don't realize is metal debris can arise from any metal surface. Uh, in respect of metal on metal, we can still have debris. Yeah, but the metal debris in an engineering, uh, is, is, uh, for an engineer, metal debris are not a problem in a moving machine because it gets changed or lubricated, it gets lost. Whereas in a biological environment, depending on the size and the volume of the metal debris, the reactive inflammatory reactive process it varies. So you can have a limited debris, big size, uh, very big particles without an inflammatory reaction. Certain size materials, high volume can produce a pseudo tumor. Now, the metal debris can also arise from a head to knee junction and there has been isolated case reports here and there where we have to go in and revise it and found that the debris are not from the metal on poly, even this, the case report which I'm going to show next uh, is uh, actually metal on poly, where the valve was from metal uh, debris from the trunium. So there is always a bit concern about metal debris from <coughs> this trunium head interface. Now why these larger heads are then called into question? Why not a 36 or a 32 or even a 28 head this? The larger heads, they generate higher frictional torque at the interface. So as they are moving, they produce the, because of the larger diameter, they can produce more frictional torque at the interface rather than a smaller heads. Um, so the, we have seen iceberg case reports here and there. This is one of the example. Uh, this is not from our center. It's, uh, it's, I took it from uh, when I did the literature search. So you can see how bad. So you can see the poly liner in its head, but as you can see, it has got a skirt and you can see that how much of a torque it has generated. And in fact, that one was, a, in fact, I think it looks like a 32 or 32 head. 
Now, the stem we are using is a standard exit stem. It's a very good track record, 91.5% at 30 years. All is colorless, so I'm not going to both, uh, uh, you know, bore you with that. The taper is a, uh, uh, it's a patented V40 taper. The V40, it's not a V, it's actually a Roman number 5. I actually asked Stryker, what does the V stand for? It's 5 degree inclination of the taper. Unlike a 1214 taper, this is a 5 degree inclination of that taper. So, it does make a difference. Now, we've been using the 40 millimeter large cobalt chromium heads for a long time purely for the reasons I already said, uh, lesser dislocation rate, primary. But the disadvantage is high frictional torque at the articulating surface and the trunnion intersurface. You can see how big the head will be in relation to the small trunnion. And so, you can see this is one of the uh, uh, in vitro studies when they did it on the large heads. So you can see some amount of metal debris from that. But the question what we have is, you can see, and the trunnion, uh, so you can see how much of damage it can cause in a trunnion. Uh, that's not an exit stem, I just took the picture for demonstrative purpose. So the question we had in ourselves, in our center was, whether these debris are so high in volume or anything, that it's becoming a clinical problem to cause an alveol reaction or a pseudotumor or something that we need to get worried, <laughs> like metal on metal articulation with the B, you know, the AS or anything like that. So whether we have, because the reason we, this question came was, when I went to the Bristol HIP meeting in 2012, there was a case report of using a 36 head, millimeter heads with the metal debris uh, requiring revision. So there was a case report being published. <coughs> so I got worried because when I was speaking, not many people were doing 40 heads. And I myself have done around 40, uh, 40 to 50 cases of using 40 millimeter heads. So in an indirect way, I will be accountable for the metal or the process I'll choose. So, uh, so we had this concern and then we wanted to go back and look in terms of, uh, so uh, we want to look essentially in our patients whether any of them have come back requiring revision or they found pseudo tumor. Because by the time we went back, these patients have been, you know, the routine follow-up and everything. We never had a chance to do a metal iron level, levels or anything like that we, because we never thought about the problem. So at the same time, we also wanted to sell midterm results. So the methods were as, as, uh, essentially the same. It's a retrospective case series between 2006 and 2008. The inclusion criteria was the 40 millimeter V40 heads implanted on a hybrid V40 taper exital poly stem uh, with the uh, uncemented uh, trident shell. Standard, all of them had standard third generation cementation. And uh, the Astabla shell was the uh, same, uh, you know, the standard trident shells with X3 liners. So the data analysis was we looked in terms of case case records, uh, whether anybody had any further revision procedure, any diagnostic procedure. We had not interfered with the normal pathway of any patient. So we had not gone back telling the patient that you need to come back, you need to do the, no, no. We didn't do it because we don't know whether is it a myth. The question what we're asking is, is it a myth or is it a clinical problem? That was the only question. So no blood tests, no ultrasound, no MRI. So, but we had a reason we went to go away is we had a quite a large number of patients. We had 114, we identified 140 patients and they were almost equally distributed. Uh, ages between 42 and 48 and we had the standard heads of 66 patients, 35, 13 plus or minus of percent. We did present this as a part of an audit in 2009. We didn't have a major dislocation wear or infection. Well, we had two infections. One was a superficial infection which settled the other one was a psoriasis patient, which is the same patient in the other group as well, because he had a 52 EX3 liner as well. So he ended up having a revision uh, 10 months post-op. So that was it. Other few complications of uh, two DVTs, one foot drop, we use post approach, which I'll recommend, one patient has a stroke. So at seven years, the question we wanted to ask was, has anybody been, has been come back to the clinic, or anybody has developed a pseudo tumor? Because it is, will be quite obvious, isn't it? Uh, we, uh, we would have seen a revision or anything. So 64 had been discharged as well. 35 being in the, still being followed up in various reasons. 15 patients had been uh, had dead uh, due to non-orthopedic causes. Uh, but touch wood, we haven't seen anybody with alcohol reaction or pseudotumor formation, which amounted to a revision or any surgeries. Uh, so that's one thing. But I'll be very cautious in saying, because if you remember, all the metal or metal articulation 
when they started to have a vision was after seven, between seven and ten years' time. So we are still following. So that's the main thing. So second outcome, yes, one patient had a fall post up a few months later and she broke her astral uh, astral collar completely. So we had to take out everything and then uh, ended up having a constraint still and finally she was happy. One patient had a trochanteric pain. Now we know that any trochanteric pain can be a sign of uh, you know the mental debris. So we, that patient was investigated, we couldn't find any cause, and then he was fine. He felt uh, right, for some reason settled, and suddenly he came and said, It's not causing me pain, and he was discharged. Um, so ultimately, we had only two cases where had, had to be revised. 15 patients had died due to either malignancy or cardiac causes, giving us a survival of 90.24% in bad survival. So far, no mental reaction we have seen. So clinical problem. Um, so in conclusion, I'll be very, very cautious in interpreting the results. I'm not saying that we have it's very safe to proceed or anything. We are no clinically relevant metal. All I can say is so far we haven't seen any major pseudotumor formation, no adverse outcomes. Again, very uh, the study is a case for a level four case series. Uh, it needs to be carefully looked at. We are having this data, uh, we are still following this up. Uh, that's the case report I want. Want to show now? Um, so, let's yeah, thank you. Uh, any questions in relationship to this? I mean, one question for you is all about the problem of modularity rather than the healthy sport or surgery tube. What does the literature say about the modular hip puncturing and where? Uh, modular hips in relation to where metal metal debris. Um, yes, uh, but again, that comes to the metal debris when it comes to modular implants, it's mm -hmm. more uh, generated on metal on metal articulation or the primary articulating surface. Yeah. When it comes to secondary articulating surface between a trunian or a, uh, in fact there are no there are other components where you have a modular neck which is fitting into a stem. But again, these are the things which is going round and round in circles. If you remember in the uh, uh, late in, uh, 80s, we had the same issues. The wear from the trunian is always a concern when you are using a larger head. But for the smaller head, we never thought about it because the debris is not that significant. But for the bigger heads, it's again, it's an engineering uh, principle based, hyper based uh, assumption. But our question is, is it a clinical problem? And that we don't know yet. And that's the purpose of this presentation. If you look at the size of the trunnion, yeah. whether you're using a bigger head or yeah. a smaller head, the trunnion size is the same. Trunnion size is the same. Trunnion size is the same. Head size is yeah. different. So the articulation which yeah. happens between the head yeah. and with the trunnion yeah. are literally the same, except the thickness increases. Yeah, but that makes a major difference because uh, if you uh, let me show the picture. You see, the head size, a uh, lot of people get uh, a bit confused with that concept. Uh, if you actually look, uh, uh, see, this is a large head. So, for example, if you're taking plus four head or minus four head, where do you think the plus four or minus four comes from? Do you think that the whole radius changes? No. no. Yeah. The trunnion in the head. Yeah. You are saying this that surface area, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's constant. It's constant. But the amount of torque it generates at that level changes with that radius. So for example, if, uh, I'm not speaking about the friction, it's a friction torque. The friction torque is directly proportional to the surface area. The surface area, so it means that larger the radius, bigger will be the torque. The actual contact area might be the same, but the amount of torque at that level is going to be higher for bigger head. You understand? If that is between the main articulation. No, 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 no. Even at the trunnion, even at the trunnion, even at the trunnion. That's the truth. Because you see this distance. Larger the distance, that. Yeah, I understand the principle. Yeah. What you're saying. Yeah. Sorry, the difference between the plus four and the minus four head. Yeah. Surely, is that not the the length of the trunnion inside the head? Uh, the trunnion size saves, but it's the depth of this chain. Yes, that's that's what yeah. I meant. Because yeah. that's a neck prop. Uh, that's a neck. Chain. Yeah, that's neck length. But the top that is generated. And that's what produces the debris. It's a top that it's a screwy movement at that level of the contact. That's what generates the debris. 
So it doesn't matter whether what the other surface areas are like. As long as this radius is getting longer and longer, that's how much of torque it's going to go through that contact surface. You understand? But if the, if the depth yeah. going into the head is bigger, longer, yeah. then you've got more potential for depth. Have you? Oh, is that left? That's, that's the largest surface area. Surface area will increase. The surface area will increase because the contact changes. But that, but that doesn't change the actual torque. The torque is, is something is eccentric to the contact surface here. Something to see. The problem here is not the metal difference. The problem is the fatigue. Yes, of the metal. Yeah, what I'm trying to say. It's not yeah, like yeah. metal on metal articulation. No, no, it's, it's not. Around see. The that's why you, got, you don't have a mass or anymore. The, the problem and is the weakness of the. As I said, the purpose of this is, this is an engineering yeah. problem. You see, we uh, expect some metal debris and everything. Our question is, because of the various case reports of solar tumor and uh, this, uh, sorry, nobody uh, Somebody to say, you know, insurance or something. Um, uh, I do apologize. Now, the, uh, the biggest problem we are having is, like, when, when I looked into the, the main reason we looked into the data was not many people were doing 40 heads and suddenly there was few case reports, isolated case reports of metal debris from the trunian. Then we realized that I, I had present only up to 114 patients. In fact, our data is around 400, 500 patients. But the reason we, are, we haven't included in this particular is none of them have come to seven years. This is between up to 2008. We had been doing a few more patients till 2012 and that was the time when I was speaking and I was saying, see, if in 10 years time, when we all retire and suddenly massive amount of patients have come with the solar tumor formation, what I don't want to do is end up in a, uh, in a paper that we had done a metal debris like, you know, like a BS uh, yes or anything like that. That was the reason we wanted to go inside, not to the patient, to see whether it's a clinical problem. I'm not saying that the metal debris are not there or not. Yes, there will be some debris, there will be some bad. From your biomechanical knowledge, yes. do you have more friction in the primary article surface when the head is bigger? Uh, frictional torque will be higher, but friction won't be. In the primary article surface? Yeah, yeah, friction doesn't have any It has no relation to the surface area. area. No, no. That's the principle between the uh, Charnis principle. Yes. Charnis called this yes. low friction torque principle. It was nothing to do with the friction. So only the torque uh, yeah. is less with a smaller head. Yeah. yeah. Just one query about your metal debris alloy reaction. I think looking at the overall picture, when you actually look at the big metal and metal articulation, yeah. I think the pathology is quite different in the sense yeah, because yeah. the amount of Contact is yeah. It's huge. It's huge. It's huge. It's huge. And so the way the patient reacts is also different, and that's why people may not react the same way. Yeah. So the amount of particles generated through this type of uh, articulation yeah. is, I think, it's doubtful to substantiate saying that the patient may likely to develop alcohol. Exactly. Yeah. See, that's true. What we have done is we have collected evidence. See, what we want to do is we want to put an end. Is it a myth or is it a really clinical problem at all? We had a good patients and we had a good data, so we thought, why don't we look at it? Rather than assuming, oh my god, it will be there, it will be there, losing sleep over it, we thought we'll look into it and just see, have anybody developed a solar tumor, has anybody come back to have a revision? So far, touch wood, we have it. But as I said to the previous presentation, in three years' time or five years' time, if we are in the newspaper saying that we have done 400 pages, with the zero team work we have to do it, then obviously, yeah, we have to cut it wrong. Just out of curiosity, the papers were presented with pseudo tumor, like yeah. which you took the lead from. And how many years did they develop the pseudo tumor? It changes. I mean, even in the, the primary metal on metal articulation, you have seen that the in the Austrian registry that they picked up the first years or failures. It was between five and seven years. We have a survival and then it suddenly dropped because of the people coming back. But as you as I said, the metal debris in a biological environment behaves completely different. You have a very big particle, it does not produce a metal reaction. You produce, you, you, if it's a very small particle, again it doesn't produce a reaction. The main problem in our biological system is it doesn't have an effective filtration system in the form of liver or kidney to get rid of these metal ions. So it has to have a certain window of size and a certain amount of volume for it to produce uh, a, an illicit and inflammatory reaction, which is what the alcohol or water we call this is. All the rest of things are the same process of local reaction.
Any other question? Did you actually, uh, the patient you identified, uh, did you correlate them with the NGR? Uh, we, uh, Mr. Perkins, the uh, NGR data is we have we can gladly look at it. No, no, I'm trying to come at get at it. You're saying that you did not have any reaction because none of these patients presented back to you. Yeah, exactly. For a clinical problem. Yeah, they no, might that's not want to miss the study. Yeah, yeah, but we in our area, we are the catchment area. We have, in fact, our we share our the closest hospital nearby is quite far away. Our close community, and believe me, the nearest unit is Dawson Street. If they have seen any of one single sewer tumor from no, our no. will, we'll notice the same thing. So, no, no, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just querying that. Yeah, yeah, we had the same doubt. Now, this is a study which I wanted to do as a proper, and I had put forth towards our ethic, uh, towards our department for us to bring the patient back for x ray, stuff like that. Now, uh, because of the cost implication and everything, we've been refused. So that's the reason I ended up doing a case for a level 4 case series presentation. Otherwise, what I would have been liking to do is bring the patient, do a proper x-rays uh, once more at one point, have metal level stuff like that, and then we can do it in a scientific way. But with the present uh, change in the environment, especially with the you know cost effective thing, um, there's no way that I could do it. Any other questions? Besides the case study that you uh, presented, there's just one case of... No, no, there has been few. I have... Uh, well, many, what is the reported rate? I mean, how... Yeah, very, very sporadic. Very, very sporadic. If you actually, if you actually look in terms of trunian related VAR, yeah. uh, we knew, we knew that there is a problem. But between the hip surgeons, we always look at it very closely. Whether it's an implant-related problem or the, whether the, those isolated cases whether they had not kept the uh, you know head seated properly because all you have to do is if you don't jam it properly and if that one is excessive strong excessive torque okay so there are various factors so unlike a metal on metal articulation I don't think we will be able to be able to find it out. Do you think this was not jammed in properly? I mean this not this one. I mean uh, that no no it's a figure of speech. Yeah. What yeah. is it? Uh, if you for example those case reports when you look in terms of trunium related wear uh, amounting to revision, you there are various various possibilities that could have been. Uh, in fact, one study showed that even a drop of blood in the trunium, well before the uh, head is being seated, can increase the wear due to oxidation. I think quite substantially. But these are invasive in studies. Multiple factors can amount to this problem. Even a patient's allergic reaction to smallest debris can also cause. So I guess uh, there is no real answer to that question. But as I said, the purpose of this study is we we had 114 uh, seven years. We just wanted to see have anybody come back. So. Any other questions? What um, just a final thought? The NJR does happily accept applications for people to research into subgroups of patients. So. It may be worthwhile looking at a. I looked at the data for the NGR published for last year, and I looked at the number of 40 heads being done on what's the survival rate and everything. There is not much change compared to our study, but I haven't got a graph. I have to say I, that's. True. It might just be worthwhile actually writing to the NGR, asking with yeah. a with a with a specific question. Right. Say you've done this work, but you'd like to increase the numbers, and you'd like to try and see if there's any clinical significance is there a, there is a grant you can apply for I think so you can yeah, actually yeah, get sure, funding sure. for yeah. it so they may they may be interested so you yeah. may well find that it's worth doing slightly, slightly but, uh, yeah bigger yeah. study well that's what we are doing at the moment I think that this is hundred but the problem is with you your it's only a, a, a single center yeah whereas the National Joint Register will so to be to get your sig any significant abnormalities, yeah. you're going to wait years. Yeah. Whereas if you if other people are using this, <coughs> that's the problem. Not many people have used it. In fact, I realize that we are the only center we have around 400 to 500 patients. We are still I'm collect I've collected the data for the, all the kids we done till 2014, and we're identifying those patients with 40 heads. So that's an ongoing project at the moment. So that will be our next presentation. That's very good. Right. Well done. So the next presentation is getting a first time upper limb surgery. Bye, Shanita. <laughs>